Everybody, I want to do something a little bit different today. Um, we're going, we don't talk a lot about equipment on here, but I've been preparing most of the week for our trip to Boston. Uh, by the time you're watching this, I'm already there. Um, but anyway, I've been preparing to go and I've never really done an equipment walkthrough of kind of how I travel and the kind of equipment that I use. Um, and this is something that's not really new that I'm doing. Uh, when I worked for seven years at the Art Museum up until this year, um, that was part of my job was we did a lot of documentary filming with visual arts that we were doing exhibitions with and things of that nature. And so um, I've spent several years kind of honing this and figuring out what works best. And the other thing that I think you should know too is that I come at this as a photographer first. Um, I was a photographer way before I ever got into doing film or video. Um, years ago, I had a real interest in doing a lot of video work, but you know, 10 years ago, video was expensive to do. Uh, the cameras were not cheap. Um, lighting wasn't cheap. Uh, it was it, things have changed a lot. Even having a computer to do digital video, they just unless you had an Avid system, computers were not strong enough to handle it, and that wasn't even HD back then. But really, in the last eight years, everything's changed, and a lot of that started. Uh, you know, when Canon put out the 5D Mark II at that time, that was one of the first DSLRs that shot video. And then all of a sudden it made video very accessible to people who were doing still photography. And that is how I got into it. So um, know that. Um, the other thing too that makes it interesting, um, I believe, is that you know, the technology has gotten not only affordable, but very compact. And it allows me to do what I do now, which is, you know, it couldn't have been done 10 years ago, really. Uh, when I was kind of starting to do this, it was very difficult. Um, and so anyway, so I want to show you kind of what I've honed in on as far as what I like to take with me and what I like to shoot with. Um, the, a couple considerations that I take into account when I'm filming is, um, one, I'm usually filming at an artist's studio or I'm filming at somebody's house or something like that. So I don't want too much stuff around around, so I try to stay fairly nimble with that. For instance, in a minute, I'll show you my lighting stands, and they're really pretty cheap, but they're small, and I can get around things, and we can set them up really easily, and so that's a consideration that I have to take into account. This is not a TV commercial or a film or, you know, one of those kinds of productions. Uh, it's usually very tight, uh, very intimate, but, you know, i am found ways to do that. Uh, the second thing, too, is, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I do is very little budget to no budget, and so, for instance, I probably could get away with renting things when I go to a city, especially like Boston, that has um, places where I can rent lights, for instance. Um, but for me, it's just easier to own them and save on that cost because just over time, the, the amount of projects that I do do not add up that way. Um, you can rent to fill in holes if you have a special need for something, but this is kind of what I've got it down to um, that I travel with all this stuff. So what we'll do is I'll kind of go around, we'll look at cameras, audio, and lighting, and I'll show you how I pack it all up and what we do. So anyway, come on over and let's start with cameras. So let's talk about cameras. Um, as I mentioned before, I come at doing video work as being a still photographer first. And you know, the DSLR was probably my introduction to video. Um, I still take my Canon, this is a 5D Mark III. Um, I upgraded from a Mark II. Uh, it shoots beautiful video. Um, but it is really not perfect for the kind of stuff that we're gonna be doing on here. Um, namely because if you're doing a long interview, uh, DSLRs have, and even this one, have a built-in time limit typically, uh, which is about 29 minutes of recording and then they shut off. And a lot of people think Think this may be a technical limitation and it's actually not. There is a European tax law which basically says that if something's going to record until you know more than 30 minutes um, that there's an extra tax because it gets put in the class of being a video camera which I think is bizarre but that's the case. So a lot of times DSLRs as much as I like the Canon 5D um, are not great for interviews. They're great for running gun stuff. They're great for b-roll obviously. Uh, they do a lot of things wonderfully and they shoot really beautiful video but they are not optimal for doing an interview so I typically do not use them on a subject when I'm recording a long interview. I might use it as a second camera but but it can't be anything that's gonna cut off at 30 minutes. You don't know what somebody's gonna be saying at the 30 minute mark, you don't know where you're gonna be in the conversation, and it's one more thing to pay attention to in time, and it's just, for me, it doesn't work very well. I will take this, I use it as a B-roll camera, and I use it for kind of up close stuff if, if, you know, if you need to run and gun or something like that. Uh, but the 5D, as, as awesome as it is, is not um, actually perfectly tuned for video, which is why I started using this a few years ago. Um, and actually, I do all of the shows that you guys watch on here on this camera. 
uh, for the most part. It's either this or one of these little Sony NEX cameras that I'm gonna show you in a minute. Uh, but this is the FS100, which is kind of the low end of the pro line. Um, they've had a recent price drop on these and you know they're not real cheap, but at the same time, if you want a really good video camera um, that's going to behave like a video camera that has beautiful footage and all that stuff, uh, these are the way to go. Um, and I really do like them. Um, typically, the microphone that is on here is okay. Uh, it's good enough to sync up audio with later. I still prefer the lav mic. In a pinch, you can get away with using this for audio. It's, it's good enough for, for a lot of things. It's just not the greatest, and I have really picky ears when it comes to audio. Um, the other thing that's really cool, um, this camera is a little box-like in nature. It just has this weird viewfinder that has limited uh, coverage when you're moving it around, but it does work, and you do need to learn a lot of <laughs> where all the buttons are when you're shooting manually, which is what you want to do. But once you get used to the camera, it does work really nicely. Um, one of the things I like on it is it has the ability to set uh, presets of picture control. And so you can do things so if like you need to, if you're in a situation like indoors where you want the contrast to do a certain thing, but you don't want it to like crush blacks, you want to do that in post, you can set a uh, picture profile to do that. Um, you know, I don't shoot raw video, obviously, we're just shooting um, to the codec of the camera. And uh, for me, uh, you want to have it look a certain way because you're going to edit it a certain way and color correct later. So that's really important. It's nice to have those presets because I can do an outdoor preset, an indoor preset, a cloudy preset. You know, I have presets for various situations and then I can modify them on the go, but it gets me in the ballpark. And you can control gamma, color, contrast, everything, uh, which is really nice. Other thing that's really cool about these is, you know, I'm not exactly made of money and the camera didn't exactly come out cheap, but I do like the Sony stuff because it has has this any X mount, which is a lot like four thirds. It's a very tight distance between the, the flange and the sensor. So you can put an adapter for just about anything on here. And this is one of my favorite lenses of all time. This is the, it's a Canon FD lens. So it's a manual focus lens, which for years, you know, Canon changed the mount on these and they were, you know, basically boat anchors. You couldn't use them on anything but old Canon film cameras. But 35 millimeter coverage, this is a super 35 millimeter size sensor. So it's plenty of coverage. And this is the 85 millimeter 1.2. And uh, I am just absolutely adore this lens. Um, it's one of my favorites uh, and it, I love the fact that I can get an adapter and I can put, I can repurpose all the lenses I already own. So this includes things like your old Nikon manual focus lenses, um, you know, Pentax lenses, whatever you can get an adapter for and you can probably find just about anything. You put Leica lenses on here if you've got them. Um, it's really nice. Or you can use the newer Zeiss and Sony lenses that are designed for the camera. Now you do lose autofocus, you, it's manual aperture only, so you have to keep that in mind. Um, so if you put a lens on here that doesn't have an aperture dial, like something that's, you know, one of the newer Canon lenses or something, you're going to have some trouble unless you have a way to power that. So anyway, um, just a couple subtleties on there, but I really like being able to use whatever lens that I want on here. It's a, it's a huge help. So that's the main camera that I use. The other cameras that I will take along in addition is usually the Canon 5D. And then I am absolutely in love with these cameras and I've shown them on the show before. I think this is one of the best deals out there. I have filmed some of the podcast episodes that you guys watch just with these cameras. This is a Sony NEX six and I'm actually filming right now on a Sony NEX five and I really love this NEX series. It's already out of date. They've changed the name to, I think it's the A6000. And I realized that there are better Sony cameras right now. There's, you know, the A7 series, you know, there's the A7S and 2 and R and all that stuff. But they're full frame still cameras. And, you know, these are designed for stills as well. I know they all do video, but these are much less expensive than the stuff I'm talking about with the Canon 7. And so the A7. So these work really f well for me. The other reason I really like them is that they are tiny. This is just the smallest thing in the world. So if you're, if you're trying to get a tight shot somewhere, like I mentioned earlier, I shoot a lot of times at artist studios or in people's homes, and it's really difficult sometimes to you know get cameras around to do b-roll and so i really like these cameras for that uh, they are not the greatest cameras in the world but the picture is beautiful um, they tend to shut off the five will get warm after a while and, and sensor will overheat and it just stops shooting video so you wouldn't want to do these for an interview or anything but for b-roll they are absolutely awesome um, I, the six is probably the best in the series and you can get these used now really cheap so if you wanted to make video on a budget uh, this is the camera i would probably go for depending on what 
what you're making. You're not going to do long interviews on it, but if you're doing, you know, internet video or shorter clips or segments or just B-roll kinds of stuff, I really, really love these. And the picture works really nicely. Uh, they sync up nice with the FS100, so there's not a lot of, you know, post I have to do on stuff like that. So these are really a dream to shoot with. And I know that they're a few years old and they're not really hip and cool right now to be using, but I, you know, they work and I love them. I think they're awesome. They also have the same Sony NEX mounts, the same adapters that go on the FS100. You can put any lens on here you want. This is a really wide um, Sony lens that's on here right now. It's a 16 millimeter 2.8. It's okay, but you can use it with all of your uh, your Nikon lenses, your old Canon manual focus. Uh, if you can get an adapter, you can, you can work, and it's the same adapter that you use on the FS100. So for me, it's a really comfortable camera to switch between. So next up, I wanna talk about audio, and I believe that this is probably one of the most important factors in a video production. And the reason I say that is, think of it this way. People will probably sit there and watch a video if the video is not so good, but the audio is clear. People will not sit there and watch pristine video with bad audio. Um, bad audio is just, especially when you're doing an interview situation, uh, it's something that you need to pay attention to. Um, for this reason, you know, you can use boom mics and stuff like that. I prefer when it's an interview type situation to use lavalier mics. And this is what I use every week on the show. Um, I'm wearing one now, you just clip it on and then you pop it into a recorder and I record all my audio separately on a recorder. The one that I have here, and this is one that I've, I'm not crazy about, I've, and I'll tell you why, but this is the Tascam DR60D. And the idea is that Tascam wanted to make a recorder that had decent preamps in it that would kind of go well with a DSLR. And it's designed to, as you can see, even the mounts under your camera, you pop that on the top, and then you have full access to your controls as you're recording. Um, there's some pros and some cons to it. The pros are that it is kind of cool. Um, you can stack it on the bottom of your camera, and so when you're the one-man show and you're operating audio and video, it's really easy to work with. It's got XLR inputs. Um, the the cons of this, the reasons I don't like it, by the way, the preamps are excellent in here, so the mics always sound good. You capture really, really good audio with very low noise on here. And so Tascam did a wonderful job on that. I don't like the fact that it's made out of plastic and it's kind of cheap, and it's no secret that this is stuck in here because it is bent and just won't come out because it's crappy plastic. Um, that I don't like. The other thing I don't like is this thing. You put four AA batteries in here and it eats them up in about 30 minutes. It's, it's awful. So what you can do is use USB power on here and so that's what I do I just have a power adapter and I plug it in and then I get unlimited power but anyway I just wish that uh, it weren't so cheesily put together and that the battery life wasn't so bad um, I've got another Sony recorder that I like to use that I'm recording on as we speak which is this one I just plug my lav into the side and I get hours and hours of recording on here with batteries so I don't know what the difference is and it must be the preamp draw or something but uh, anyway that's the audio recorder I use I use dedicated audio and what I will do is I will blend this um, Final Cut um, has a really excellent way of automatically aligning audio and it works about 95% of the time and so it makes it really easy um, if you're using Premiere or something like that you might want to use a clapboard or something because I don't use time code in any of the productions that I do the other thing I use um, this is a Sony lavalier mic it's overkill but it's excellent I bought this a few years ago it's not a cheap microphone but it is excellent and it is an XLR mic um, use these cable ties to keep it tidy, but anyway, you clip that onto your lapel. Uh, make sure when you have a really nice mic, they tend to pick up everything. You do want a foam cover for this because I've had people who rustle around a lot and if it's metal, it can, depending on what their clothing's made of, it can rub up against that. Uh, and then this is the XLR output and then I use that to output to the device. So that's typically how I record an interview. Just make sure everything's clean. Bring a pair of headphones, even if it's just earbuds, so you can just monitor your audio and make sure that you're getting clean audio and that every, everything sounds good um, and as far as that goes. Okay, so on to lighting equipment. And I travel with these two small, this is the ICANN IB500 LED lamp. And I'll turn this around a minute so you can see the barn doors and all this. What I do is I actually use just a fusion paper to cover them with. You don't need to buy an expensive adapter for this. I use clothespins and I just clip it to the front of the lamp. Um, what I like about LEDs is they do not get hot, which is, is very cool. Um, so, you know, in the old days when you had hot lamps and you'd have to let things cool before you could do tear down um, and wear gloves when you move them about. Um, these do not get hot, so they're really nice to use. They keep people comfortable. They don't cast off heat if you're doing an interview with somebody and make them uncomfortable. So a couple really cool things about these. Uh, first of all, they have a dimmer on the back. It's just up and down arrows and it's a touch panel. So I can just 
press and hold and go down and I can dim that light all the way down to what it's telling me is 10%. And you can micro adjust in increments of one in the percentage. Uh, one annoying thing about this is the light does beep every time you touch it. It has remote control for these two, but it does beep and it is annoying and uh, there's no way to turn it off. So that's a drag. Let's turn this all the way back up. So I'm going to show you another thing that's cool about this. The other thing that's really neat is that the color balance you can, you can adjust on here too, which is really nice if you're having to uh, use this light as a supplement, which you often do with natural light coming through a window or something like that. Right now it's set at daylight, which is at 56, and the color is adjustable too. And you just dial in the temperature all the way down to 32K. And so you can see, I don't know if this camera's auto adjusting or not, but it does get warmer or cooler depending and anywhere in the middle. So that is a really nice feature of this lamp as well. I've got two of these. I don't know if you can see the other one behind it at all. It's back there. And I just cover them up with diffusion paper um, that I roll up and put in my case and they work great. Um, these are not perfect. They're not very big. They're, they're pretty small. And so basically, what this means is when you're lighting somebody, the lamp does need to be pretty close to their face. And you know, this is not optimal. You'll get better lighting and a bigger cast if you have a bigger lamp. And I just don't because I have to travel with these and so I just kind of make do. So that's one small complaint about them. But that's about it. Um, the other thing is, you know, I don't have great stands that I keep these on and that actually is intentional. These stands are really small and they are easy to fit in a the case. They're not heavy. They're not great. Um, if I break one, I'll have to buy another one, but I do have them and uh, they work for what I'm doing with the travel setup. But these lights fold down really nicely. You'll see in a minute when I put them in the case and the attachment for the power comes off. You plug it straight in the wall. I fold those up and uh, I'll show you too. I have some separate bags. I keep those in, but basically I have two of these lamps and uh, it would be nice to have a third. Um, I just am out of room at this point. You want to do a three point light setup and be able to remove people from the background by putting a little bit of light on their shoulders sometimes. And I really, you know, I'm a little bit handicapped there and then I have to figure something else out, but, uh, but they work and, and they're great. So um, in a second, I'm going to show you how everything folds up together. Okay, so everything folds down into two cases. One I check and the other I carry on. I carry on this top one. Um, this is the Think Tank. I love this bag. There's not much to say about it. I'll show it to you really quickly. But this is the Airport Security version 2.0 and it is phenomenal. Uh, it's not a cheap bag, but worth every penny. Um, everything fits in here really nicely, very tightly. Uh, it's got pockets everywhere and you can get all your stuff in there and it's great. What's really cool is it fits in the overhead bin and it also fits in that, you know, if you have this where you live, but in the United States, they have that crazy box you have to stick your luggage in to make sure it'll fit, which is smaller than the overhead. And this fits in that as well. So very cool. The other case, this is the one that I check all my lights go in here. This is a Pelican Storm case. This is the 2950 and uh, I love it. It's very cool. It has basically this memory foam inside, which I have cut out and modified to fit. Basically, there's two layers in here. You take out the top, the second layer. Um, second layer has a light as well. Top layer has a light. There's a tripod on each layer for, sorry, these are the stands for the lights and I have a tripod underneath as well. This is the diffusion paper rolled up and I keep one compartment kind of open for other stuff. Um, these are really cool. I'll link to them in the show notes if you guys are interested. These are just these neoprene case logic bags and I've got two of these. They're designed for like a, I don't know, a tablet or something. But I like them because they put, basically these lights come with, there's a handle you take off, there's a mount, and then you have the power cable. Everything fits in here and I've got two of those. And I also lock this and uh, you want to get, um, it's actually over there, but uh, there's a small padlock that goes on the front. You can get TSA approved padlocks, which basically mean you set the combination, but TSA does have a master key that will indeed open the padlock. So they can get into it if they need to, but uh, eh, it keeps it more secure than just checking this to where anybody could open it. So anyway, I checked the lights. It's not too heavy. Uh, weight is another issue because if it's too heavy, you can't take it. You have to ship it and uh, it's a big pain. So anyway, that's pretty much um, the gear and the road cases and how I travel. I hope you guys have found this interesting and useful on some level. And this is just the setup that I use right now. It's not perfect. Um, I would like to change some things out and expand over time, but within my budget and what I have to work with right now, this does pretty well. Um, you know, 
know, there's some little things that could be different. Like I would like to have larger lights. I'd really like to have a third light so I can do three point lighting setups when I travel. And it just, it, it, you know, it's more money to do that one right now. And two, it's more stuff to carry. So I have to be very careful about that. But I also think, and this is because I come from a photography background, working within limitations sometimes uh, is not a bad thing. It forces you to be a little bit creative and think of things a little bit differently. So I would say too, with, you know, your own setup and your own equipment, the things that are the most important is being able to understand the limitations of what you have, what you're able to do and what you're able to not do, and sometimes be creative within that, like I was just saying. And two, it needs to be something you're very consistently using. Um, nothing can waste time and kill things faster than if you're not familiar with how your light's set up, for instance, because you don't use them that often, or if you have new gear all the time and you don't understand how it works or how to put it together. Um, and, you know, you probably understand how to put it together, but if you can't do it fast, um, it can waste a lot of time. So that's really important is to, to understand um, that in terms of setup. Uh, the other thing is making checklists, and I really didn't talk about this too much today, but I've done this because I've done this in the past. It's an easy mistake to make where you forget one little piece of gear that completely can kill a shoot if you're not careful. Um, you know, if you forget to grab a folder of memory cards and you don't have enough or you don't have any, you forget a battery, you forget a charger, something like that, um, then you're scrambling around on set to try to find things to make it still happen. I've done those in the past. I think we all have, but um, you know, it's trying to stay organized and pretty meticulous about that is, is very key. Uh, anyway, by the time you're watching this, like I said, I've probably already up there filmed most of this, but uh, I'm really excited about getting to do this. Um, the Harold Feinstein documentary is kind of the first and this thing I've had in my mind for a long time that I wanted to do with the show. It's going to be a lot different than what you see on here during the week. It's going to be a very special thing. And what my hope is, is that we can kind of continue this and do special things every three or four months or so. So stay on the lookout for more of that. Anyway, guys, I'll see you next week in our regular episode once I'm back in town. And once again, this has been another episode of The Art of Photography. And thank you all for watching. I'll see you later.